On January 16, 1920, Congress passed the 18th Amendment to the Constitution, making the production and distribution of alcoholic beverages illegal. This was a revolutionary attempt to reform American society. Yet, no one expected the reaction of the American people to be quite what it was. Before the most famous attempt at prohibition took place, there were several other attempts to limit the consumption of alcohol by Americans. In 1637, in Massachusetts, local lawmakers passed a law to moderate drinking. In Georgia, in 1735, the London Trustees Act proclaimed that no rum, brandies, spirits, or strong waters could enter the colony. Often, the leading forces behind these temperance movements were religious groups. The idea of temperance for religious reasons continued into the 1920s. It started with the Women's Crusade. The National Women's Temperance Union, with its Lips That Touch Liquor Shall Not Touch Ours campaign, lobbied for total elimination of alcohol. The Anti-Saloon League, which was formed in 1893, also campaigned against alcohol. These groups were able to enact local prohibition laws, but were still pushing for national temperance. You know what the liquor industry wants to do to them? They want to feed them that old rock gut. Honky tonks by slick haired butchers who play on the floor of American womanhood. I say alcohol was good. Saloons were not only looked down upon because of the drinking that went on there, but because they often played host to other vices as well, such as prostitution and gambling. On January 16, 1920, temperance groups got their wish. The 18th Amendment to the Constitution was passed making the manufacturing and distribution of alcoholic beverages illegal. The goal was to create a sober nation in 30 years. In the first years of prohibition, this revolution proved successful. America had officially gone dry. The reaction to this new amendment varied greatly. Religious groups cheered, glad that national temperance had been accepted. Some went as far as to have mock funerals for personifications of alcohol. Still, others reacted quite differently. One New York restaurant gave out miniature coffins as souvenirs and invited people to bring their own liquor. Although the average person was unable to obtain liquor, prescription alcohol and sacramental wine were still available. It was not unheard of that this was taken advantage of. Often, doctors would write prescriptions for anyone who asked, charging a fee and making a profit for themselves. Even priests and rabbis would take advantage of their ability to purchase wine. Illegal production of alcohol began just as soon as stills could be set up. Bootleggers produced moonshine in rural areas, as well as whiskey and other liquors in homes and apartments. In fact, these made up the largest percentage of alcohol consumed during the Prohibition period. The conditions this liquor was produced in were less than ideal. They were often dirty and unsanitary. Prohibition agents sometimes found dead cats, rats, mice, and insects floating in the liquid that would be distilled into liquid. To get this alcohol to the public, illegal saloons called speakeasies and blind pigs started to pop up. In the East, the term speakeasy came from the Irish term for the illicit bars, encouraging patrons to be quiet and speak easy in order to avoid attracting undue attention. In the Midwest, the term blind pig was more popular. These clubs multiplied rapidly, becoming havens for young men joined, for the first time, by women. Prohibition was intertwined with the women's revolution in the 1920s. Girls cut their long hair into short bobs, as well as changing from long, flowing dresses to short, straight skirts. Makeup also became more heavily used as women joined men in the saloons and carried their own flasks. As alcohol was being produced, a method of transporting it to the saloons had to be devised. Rum running, as it would come to be known, was accomplished in several ways. Illegal liquor was brought in from Canada and Europe by boat, providing work to unemployed fishermen. Domestic routes were traveled by car or truck. Home-brewed whiskey was carried from rural areas into urban saloons all over the country, often by teenagers. Prohibition and the resulting production, transportation, and sale of illegal liquor laid the groundwork for organized crime and started the business of the famous mobster Al Capone. Capone got his start at a nightclub called The Four Deuces in Chicago. He was named manager of the club by his friend and mentor, Johnny Torrio, and together they built an enormous beer business. With help from out-of-work brewmasters, they created an enormous, elaborate network of breweries, rum runners, and speakeasies, paying off coughs and politicians as they went. 
Capone spent nearly $50 million a year bribing and winning favors from police, prohibition agents, and politicians tasked with shutting him down. The operation was moved out of Chicago to the western suburb of Cicero as the police cracked down on bootleggers. In fact, there was a large reaction by government agents as bootlegging became widespread. Although one out of every 11 agents was being paid off, prohibition agents were still fairly successful in taking down bootleggers and speakeasies. Two New York agents in particular made their names and faces known by their determination and creativity in taking down saloons. Isidore Einstein and Mo Smith would dress up and trick owners into allowing them access before shutting down the saloon. In one busy night, the pair could shut down 48 speakeasies. Over their entire career, they made 4,392 arrests, 95% of which ended in convictions. Although these two were well known, other prohibition agents were successful as well. Liquor that was found was destroyed immediately. Bottles were smashed and liquor was poured down storm drains and over hillsides. Rum runners were chased down, often ending in car crashes where offenders would be arrested and the liquor disposed of. Violence surrounding the prohibition laws began to escalate, both between prohibition agents and bootleggers, as well as between rival organized crime families. All of this culminated in what would come to be known as the beginning of the end of prohibition, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. On February 14, 1929, two men in police uniforms and three men in plain clothes entered a warehouse on Clark Street in Chicago. Seven men working for one of Capone's rivals were inside and obeyed the apparent police officer's orders. They were then shot defenseless as they had their backs turned and their hands in the air. After the shooting, the men in plain clothes walked out of the warehouse while the men in police uniforms followed them with guns trained on their backs. They then got in their car, complete with police lights and siren, and vanished, never to be seen again. Only three weeks after the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, on March 4, 1929, Herbert Hoover was sworn in as America's 31st president. He began listening to American citizens and stated, If citizens do not like the law, their duty as honest men and women is to discourage its violation. Their right is to openly work for repeal. In March of 1933, Franklin Roosevelt was sworn into office. Between the people's insistence and the onset of the Great Depression, the repeal of the 18th Amendment was made official by the acceptance of the 21st Amendment. Even Al Smith, the governor of New York, was glad for the repeal. Of course, I am delighted, but not surprised, by the final repeal of the 18th Amendment. I felt all along that when this matter was properly submitted to the rank and file of our people, they would readily see that it had no place in our Constitution. It would be very difficult, if not impossible, to estimate the benefit that will come to this country from the lesson taught to the coming generations to make it their business to see that no such matter as this is ever again made the subject of federal constitutional law. And although Smith could not say how great the benefit would be, it was clear that there would indeed be a benefit. <laughs> The decisive vote of the 36th state against prohibition is happy news for the grain raisers of the United States and for many others throughout the land. With an eye on December 5th, work is being rushed in distilleries and bottling works. Thousands are being called back to work in plants of allied industries. At least 500,000 new jobs are predicted as a result of repeal. From keg and barrel factories, perhaps the most closely allied line, immediate benefits from repeal extend into almost every line of business and commerce. However, everyone's not waiting until December 15th. The lid is off in many places, with the downfall of prohibition being celebrated in real old-time hilarity. Yes, and by the renewal of old acquaintances, hotels and nightclubs report a real pre-war spirit among those revelers. Boy! Uh-oh! There'll be no more scenes such as this. Barrel after barrel of prize whiskeys destroyed by government agents. It's going to be a cold winter for the barrel busters.